When machines become masters, Darwin among the machines, Samuel Butler. Introduction. Intellectually speaking, Samuel Butler, 1835 to 1902, was quite an unusual thinker. Even though he accepted the theory of evolution and deeply admired Charles Darwin's work on the subject, he vehemently disagreed with him over his and Wallace's use of the term natural selection. Butler saw Darwin's usage as confused and muddled, since it implies that the external conditions which cause a variation are to be distinguished from the conditions which accumulate and perfect such variation. That is to say, he implies a radical difference between the process of variation and the process of selection. This, I have already said, does not seem to me acceptable. The selection I conceive to be simply the variation which has survived. Alfred Russell Wallace also later felt that natural selection implied too much, as if nature was consciously picking and choosing which organism should live or die, when in fact there is no such teleology. Thus, Wallace wrote to Darwin in July of 1866, suggesting that he instead co-opt Herbert Spencer's pithy phrase, survival of the fittest. Darwin responded warmly to the idea and eventually used it in the fifth edition of Origin of Species. However, Butler was also not satisfied with this as well, since, as he pointed out, why is the survival of the fittest more a means of modification than, we will say, the fact that animals live at all, or that they live in successive generations, being born, continuing their species, and dying instead of living on forever as one single animal in the common acceptation of the term? or than that they eat and drink. The heat whereby the water is heated, the water which is turned into steam, the piston on which the steam acts, the driving wheel, etc., etc., are all one as much as another a means whereby a train is made to go from one place to another. It is impossible to say that any one of them is the main means. So, mutatis mutandis, with modification, there is no reason, therefore, why the survival of the fittest should claim to be an especial means of modification rather than any other necessary adjunct of animal or vegetable life. Butler is also upset with Darwin's dismissal of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck since he feels much of the Frenchman's theories dovetail almost precisely with Darwin's if a wider latitude is given to such specialised terms as circumstances. As Butler explains, but the word circumstances, so frequently used by Lamarck for the conditions of an animal's existence, contains, by implication, the idea of animals which shall exist or not, according as they fulfil those conditions or fail to fulfil them. Conditions of existence are conditions which something capable of existing must fulfil if it would exist at all, and nothing is a condition of an animal's existence which that animal need not comply with and may yet continue to exist. Again, the words animals and plants comprehend the ideas of fit, fitter, and fittest, unfit, unfitter, and unfittest for certain conditions, for we know of no animals or plants in which we do not observe degrees of fitness or unfitness for their circumstances or environment or conditions of existence. Nevertheless, despite his deep disagreements with Darwin, Butler was a great admirer of the naturalist, and in the preface to the second edition of his book, Evolution, Old and New, he praises his rival with the following, I have always admitted myself to be under the deepest obligations to Mr. Darwin's works, and it was with the greatest reluctance, not to say repugnance, that I became one of his opponents. I have partaken of his hospitality, and have had too much experience of the charming simplicity of his manner not to be among the readiest to at once admire and envy it. It is unfortunately true that I believe Mr. Darwin to have behaved badly to me. This is too notorious to be denied, but at the same time I cannot be blind to the fact that no man can be judge in his own case, and that after all, Mr. Darwin may have been right, and I wrong. Yet, 
what apparently changed Butler from a sympathizer of all things Darwinian to a harsh critic had much to do with the absence of teleological drives. As Doug Hill illuminates, Butler repeatedly argued that Darwinism explained the mechanics of evolution but overlooked its impetus. Butler believed purposefulness imbues all of creation. It is therefore not surprising to learn that Butler himself wrote several books on evolution which still have merit, particularly for those philosophers, like Thomas Nagel, and thinkers who believe that there is still something missing in the Darwinian paradigm for life and its emergence. One of the most provocative essays Butler wrote came under his pen name, Solarius. It carried the engaging title, Darwin Among the Machines, and was first published in New Zealand on June 13, 1863, in the press. Here, Butler, perhaps with a slight tongue in his cheek and with some irony, theorizes that machines will one day supplant humankind, making us their servants. To avoid this horrible fate, Butler enjoins his readers that we should get rid of such machinery before it becomes our lord and master. As Butler exclaims, war to the death should be instantly proclaimed against them. Every machine of every sort should be destroyed by the well-wisher of his species. Let there be no exceptions made, no quarter shown. Let us at once go back to the primeval condition of the race. Writing more than a century later, George Dyson, son of the famous Freeman Dyson, cribbing the title of his book from Butler's original essay on the subject, argued that in the future machines would one day become supremely intelligent, transcending human cognition. Today, the dangers of artificial intelligence evolving beyond human control have become a serious concern among scientists, technologists and politicians. Because of Butler's doomsday prophecies concerning machines, he may be rightly regarded as one of the earliest thinkers to postulate a technological singularity. Unlike Ray Kurzweil, who sees such an event as mostly positive, Butler's position is Luddite to the extreme. As the Singularity Symposium website suggests, Samuel Butler was probably the first Luddite technophobe who wrote a philosophical argument defending the complete annihilation of the machines and the return to traditional medievalism. One suspects that Samuel Butler didn't really accept his own prognostications, given that he didn't resist having his books published on sophisticated printing presses, nor did he eschew all the creature comforts of the late 19th century. Even though we may disagree with many of Samuel Butler's lamentations, I believe he is an important voice, especially since we are now living at a time where his prophecies may indeed come true. Darwin Among the Machines To the Editor of the Press, Christchurch, New Zealand, the 13th of June, 1863. Sir, there are few things of which the present generation is more justly proud than of the wonderful improvements which are daily taking place in all sorts of mechanical appliances, and indeed it is matter for great congratulation on many grounds. It is unnecessary to mention these here, for they are sufficiently obvious. Our present business lies with considerations which may somewhat tend to humble our pride and to make us think seriously of the future prospects of the human race. If we revert to the earliest primordial types of mechanical life, to the lever, the wedge, the inclined plane, the screw and the pulley, or, for analogy would lead us one step further, to that one primordial type from which all the mechanical kingdom has been developed, we mean to the lever itself, and if we then examine the machinery of the Great Eastern, we find ourselves almost awestruck at the vast development of the mechanical world, at the gigantic strides with which it has advanced in comparison with the slow progress of the animal and vegetable kingdom. We shall find it impossible to refrain from asking ourselves what the end of this mighty movement is to be. In what direction is it tending? What will be its upshot? To give a few imperfect hints towards a solution of these questions is the object of the present letter. We have used the words mechanical life, the mechanical kingdom, the mechanical world and so forth, and we have done so advisedly, for as the vegetable kingdom was slowly developed from the mineral 
and as in like manner the animal supervened upon the vegetable, so now in these last few ages an entirely new kingdom has sprung up, of which we as yet have only seen what will one day be considered the antediluvian prototypes of the race. We regret deeply that our knowledge both of natural history and of machinery is too small to enable us to undertake the gigantic task of classifying machines into the genera and subgenera, species, varieties and subvarieties, and so forth, of tracing the connecting links between machines of widely different characters, of pointing out how subservience to the use of man has played that part among machines which natural selection has performed in the animal and vegetable kingdoms, of pointing out rudimentary organs, which exist in some few machines, feebly developed and perfectly useless, yet serving to mark descent from some ancestral type which has either perished or been modified into some new phase of mechanical existence. We can only point out this field for investigation. It must be followed by others whose education and talents have been of a much higher order than any which we can lay claim to. Some few hints we have determined to venture upon, though we do so with the profoundest diffidence. Firstly, we would remark that as some of the lowest of the vertebrata attained a far greater size than has descended to their more highly organised living representatives, so a diminution in the size of machines has often attended their development and progress. Take the watch, for instance. Examine the beautiful structure of the little animal, watch the intelligent play of the minute members which compose it, Yet this little creature is but a development of the cumbrous clocks of the 13th century. It is no deterioration from them. The day may come when clocks, which certainly at the present day are not diminishing in bulk, may be entirely superseded by the universal use of watches, in which case clocks will become extinct like the earlier Saurians, while the watch, whose tendency has for some years been rather to decrease in size than the contrary, will remain the only existing type of an extinct race. The views of machinery which we are thus feebly indicating will suggest the solution of one of the greatest and most mysterious questions of the day. We refer to the question, what sort of creature man's next successor in the supremacy of the earth is likely to be? We have often heard this debated, but it appears to us that we are ourselves creating our own successors. We are daily adding to the beauty and delicacy of their physical organization. We are daily giving them greater power and supplying by all sorts of ingenious contrivances that self-regulating, self-acting power, which will be to them what intellect has been to the human race. In the course of ages, we shall find ourselves the inferior race. Inferior in power, inferior in that moral quality of self-control, we shall look up to them as the acme of all that the best and wisest man can ever dare to aim at. No evil passions, no jealousy, no avarice, no impure desires will disturb the serene might of those glorious creatures. Sin, shame and sorrow will have no place among them. Their minds will be in a state of perpetual calm. The contentment of a spirit that knows no wants is disturbed by no regrets. Ambition will never torture them. Ingratitude will never cause them the uneasiness of a moment. The guilty conscience, the hope deferred, the pains of exile, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes, these will be entirely unknown to them. If they want feeding, by the use of which very word we betray our recognition of them as living organism, they will be attended by patient slaves whose business and interest it will be to see that they shall want for nothing. If they are out of order, they will be promptly attended to by physicians who are thoroughly acquainted with their constitutions. If they die, for even these glorious animals will not be exempt from that necessary and universal consummation, they will immediately enter into a new phase of existence. For what machine dies entirely in every part at one and the same instant? We take it that when the state of things shall have arrived, which we have been above attempting to describe, man will have become to the machine what the horse and the dog are to man. 
He will continue to exist, nay even to improve, and will be probably better off in his state of domestication under the beneficent rule of the machines than he is in his present wild state. We treat our horses, dogs, cattle and sheep on the whole with great kindness. We give them whatever experience teaches us to be best for them, and there can be no doubt that our use of meat has added to the happiness of the lower animals far more than it has detracted from it. In like manner, it is reasonable to suppose that the machines will treat us kindly, for their existence is as dependent upon ours as ours is upon the lower animals. They cannot kill us and eat us as we do sheep. They will not only require our services in the parturition of their young, which branch of their economy will remain always in our hands, but also in feeding them, in setting them right when they are sick, and burying their dead, or working up their corpses into new machines. It is obvious that if all the animals in Great Britain save man alone were to die, and if at the same time all intercourse with foreign countries were by some sudden catastrophe to be rendered perfectly impossible, it is obvious that under such circumstances the loss of human life would be something fearful to contemplate. In like manner were mankind to cease, the machines would be as badly off or even worse. The fact is that our interests are inseparable from theirs, and theirs from ours. Each race is dependent upon the other for innumerable benefits, and, until the reproductive organs of the machines have been developed in a manner which we are hardly yet able to conceive, they are entirely dependent upon man for even the continuance of their species. It is true that these organs may be ultimately developed inasmuch as man's interest lies in that direction. There is nothing which our infatuated race would desire more than to see a fertile union between two steam engines. It is true that machinery is even at this present time employed in begetting machinery, in becoming the parent of machines often after its own kind, but the days of flirtation, courtship and matrimony appear to be very remote, and indeed can hardly be realised by our feeble and imperfect imagination. Day by day, however, the machines are gaining ground upon us. Day by day we are becoming more subservient to them. More men are daily bound down as slaves to tend them. More men are daily devoting the energies of their whole lives to the development of mechanical life. The upshot is simply a question of time, but that the time will come when the machines will hold the real supremacy over the world and its inhabitants is what no person of a truly philosophic mind can for a moment question. Our opinion is that war to the death should be instantly proclaimed against them. Every machine of every sort should be destroyed by the well-wisher of his species. Let there be no exceptions made, no quarter shown. Let us at once go back to the primeval condition of the race. If it be urged that this is impossible under the present condition of human affairs, this at once proves that the mischief is already done, that our servitude has commenced in good earnest, that we have raised a race of beings whom it is beyond our power to destroy, and that we are not only enslaved, but are absolutely acquiescent in our bondage. For the present, we shall leave this subject, which we present greatest to the members of the Philosophical Society. Should they consent to avail themselves of the vast field which we have pointed out, we shall endeavour to labour in it ourselves at some future and indefinite period.